ever, and uh, they said they're really busy, so I had to wait about four or five days to get it in, but, but uh, I, I had an appointment. <laughs> right? Okay, just, I don't even have to say it. You know what I'm saying. So this past Tuesday, early in the morning, I dropped my car off for my appointment. And uh, I, I dropped it off, and I get there, and, and the first thing they tell me, you know, so my expectation was, like, I'm going to drop this thing off, get it by the end of the day at the latest. And first thing they say to me is, uh, yeah, we will definitely not have it ready today. It'll be at least tomorrow. And I said, really? I said, oh, it'd been so great to just kind of know that, you know, and on the phone, you know, help me arrange my life and all of that. And... Uh, uh, I, I, it's, it was, I was very kind to him. I said, well, do you, do you have a loaner vehicle? They said, no. I said, well, do you, do you have rental vehicles? They said, no. I said, do you have anything that I need right now? They said, no. <laughs> no, they didn't really. But I said, okay. So at this point, I'm getting, I'm getting a little um, agitated. It takes a lot for me to get agitated, actually. Well, some of the staff might not think that. But, you know, just... You know, I, so I really believe in being kind to people regardless of agitation, right? Like you're just, you're just kind to people regardless of what's happening because that's what we do. And so, but I'm getting like really agitated. And uh, all of a sudden I start remembering these sermons on the Jesus way. And then I start remembering these like messages that, that like were preached about like our words being so powerful. And so I just like, man, I just was like, okay, God bless you. And I left. And, uh. So I went and I got this rental across town, and, and so the day goes by. The next day, it's late afternoon, and I hadn't heard anything about my car. And I called. So I called. I said, is it ready? And um, they said, oh, we actually haven't looked at it. I said, really? Really? Okay. They said, it's next in line. I said, okay. The next day comes. No word. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Long story short, at the end of four full days, oh, you feel my pain. You feel it. I can feel it in the room. You feel it. It's ready. And so I, I am just like, just kind of going through my mind in prayer what I'm going to say when I get there. <laughs> just bringing it before the Lord, right? And uh, I, I was going to just have this really kind but direct conversation with them. Sometimes you got to have a direct conversation, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Just, but it can be in kindness and Jesus and all of that. And when I got there, uh, the guy ahead of me, he actually went and took care of that conversation without me having to do it. <laughs> and uh, I got it. But the problem was he, he kind of left out the kind. He just in, went double on the direct. You, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I, at the end of it, I actually felt a lot of compassion for the poor workers there. And uh, so I didn't say anything, and I just blessed them, and I left. Um, but, uh, the, you know, the, I was thinking about this all week. I'm like, you know how when you're in the middle of something, you're like, there must be a deeper meaning to what's happening to me. You know? And uh, so I was thinking through this. Um, I, I thought the point of an appointment was so you didn't have to wait. And, and I was wrong on that. Um, and and they, they never, but I was thinking about this, they actually never told me how long it would take. But I had an expectation of a timeline that was not met. And I had to wait way longer than I expected. Have you ever had to wait a, l a lot longer than you expected? Yeah. And, and, and that's the intro to my message. Come on. The Lord works all things for his good, Right? He uses everything. He's even using that terrible story that an experience. But that, that is what happened to a couple in the Bible named Zechariah and Elizabeth. Except it wasn't only a four-day wait. It was really a wait of a lifetime. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a really long wait. And in the book of, of Luke, if you have your Bibles, open them with me this morning. There was this priest. His name was Zechariah. And his wife, whose name was Elizabeth, and and it says that they were both righteous before God. They were both blameless in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they, it says, had no child because Elizabeth was barren and, they, and, was advanced, uh, they, and, and both were advanced in years. Both of them were righteous before the Lord. Both of them were lovers of God. And so one day, Zechariah 
who was on duty serving as a priest in the temple. And it was, a, it was customary for the priest to cast lots to see who would go into the holy place to burn incense before the Lord. In fact, as I was studying this and reading about this, they said that there's actually was around 20,000 priests in the time of Jesus. That's almost as many pastors as there are in Springfield. <laughs> it's amazing, not quite that many. But it's likely that you would only be called upon actually once in your lifetime to actually go into the holy place and to have that moment uh, of burning incense before the Lord. It would have been the biggest moment in a priest's life, a, a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And on this day, Zechariah was chosen to do it. And while he goes in to perform that priestly duty in the temple, a multitude of worshipers would gather outside and they would wait and they would pray. And it says that as Zechariah was in that, that holy place, as he was standing alone there before the altar of incense, it says the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar. And it says this in verse 12, you can follow along. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord and he must not drink wine or strong drink and he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. That's just an incredible moment. It's an incredible moment that's happening to Zechariah here. The angel says, your, your prayer has been heard. Your wife is gonna bear a son. Can you imagine what in this moment these words would have meant to somebody who had been praying and believing and waiting an entire lifetime to have a child? And I, I'm imagining that as he is, is, is an old man, he said, that he would have had one of two responses. His first thing would have been to weep with tears of joy or weep with tears of, I'm too old and too tired to have a child. <laughs> How many parents can, <laughs> you know what I'm, okay. You know what I'm talking about. But what a word over your unborn child. All the detail that's given to him in that moment. He's going to be great before the Lord. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, even in the womb. He's going to persuade many in Israel to turn back to the Lord. He's going to operate in the same anointing and same power as Elijah. He's going to be a forerunner. He's actually going to prepare the way for the Lord. I mean, that is a word, right? It's incredible. Verse 18 says, in Zechariah's response to all of this was this. This is his response. He says this question. He says, how shall I know this? Now, in my holy imagination, which is like, I like to call it holy, holy imagination, I imagine that angel to be like, um, how shall you know this? You're going to know this because I just told you. Right? Like, I just told you what's going to happen. That's how you know. And we're, we're like standing in this holy place, Zach. You and me. <laughs> the angel of the Lord. What more do you need? Are you in there with me? Yeah, I know you are. You're weird like me. It's good. He says, this is what he says. He says, so how shall I know this? He says, for I'm an old, old man. And my wife is advanced in years. <laughs> I, love, I love that he calls himself old, but he phrases it much more politely for his wife. <laughs> She's advanced in years. It's, you know, Christy's two years older than me, so that's the term I use for her as well. <laughs> She's advanced. <laughs> Sounds so much better. Even back then, there was this age sensitivity, right? Oh my gosh, the women are mad at me, the men are afraid for me right now. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, let's move on. 
<clears throat> get back into the flow with the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, and the angel, it says, answered him. He says, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent. That's what Christy's praying about me right now. <laughs> and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Everybody say, in their time. Say it again, in their time. So outside the temple, the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they're wondering what's taking so long. And when he came out, he tried to speak, and he, he couldn't speak. And it says he kept making signs to them. He's like gesturing because he couldn't get his words to come out. And they realized that he'd had some sort of an encounter, some sort of a visitation, but he was muted. So just like the angel said a little bit later in the, in the chapter, Elizabeth conceives as the angel said, and John is born, and, and when they bring him to be circumcised, they ask them what his name will be, and they all assumed it would be like Zach Jr., right? Because that's what they did back then. They started asking Zachariah, like motioning, like, what, what, what's his name going to be? And he couldn't, he couldn't talk, and so he asked for a little pad to write down the name. And what he wrote down, he said, he said his name is John. And it says in verse 64 there, it says that immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. <laughs> when Zechariah went in to minister to the Lord in that holy place, we don't know exactly what he prayed while he was in there. As I was kind of studying the scholars and, and commentators, they, they actually agreed that it was highly unlikely that he was still praying and believing for a child for himself, that he was, he was probably praying in the temple for, for the Messiah to come, not for his own son to come. But the angel says to him, your prayer has been heard. And the truth is that the prayer that, that had been prayed from his heart all those years was heard the first time that he prayed it. Do you know that? Your prayers are heard the first time you bring them before the Lord. But now this word has come forth. You're going to have a son. And after all these years of disappointment and all these years of longing and desire and these years of doubt and seemingly unanswered prayer, the word comes and he does not believe the word. And because of the unbelief, he's silenced and he's unable to speak until the promise is fulfilled. God didn't take the promise back because of his unbelief, but unbelief kept him from fully enjoying it. He had such amazing news to tell, but he just couldn't tell it. Unbelief doesn't necessarily destroy the promise of God. It does, however, impact our ability to fully experience the joy of the promise. Have you experienced this in your life? God spoke to you something, but doubt began to overshadow what he said. And so you were taken out of the joy of the moment of believing. Whether it's the written word of God that's full of promises for us, or whether it's a prophetic word from the Lord that he's spoken to you, something that you just know in your heart that God has said to you, when unbelief overshadows what he says, we miss out on the joy of journeying with the promise. We miss out on partaking and participating in the good news because unbelief keeps us from fully entering it. The angel of the Lord said that the words that he spoke would be fulfilled in their time. And that really stood out to me as I was studying this and as I was praying for today and what the heart of the Lord wanted to release for us in this day, but meaning that the words that are spoken from the Father are not spoken in our time. That the words that are sent from heaven will be fulfilled in their time, in God's time. 
And some of us have been missing out on the joy and the peace that is to be ours that comes in believing. Some of us have stopped believing and become cynical and skeptical because our believing was connected to our time. Instead of believing in the word of the Lord, which comes in his time. And when his time was in our time, we took it as a no time. <laughs> well, I, I, I really, it's so powerful. When, when his time was in our time, because it didn't happen, we took it as him saying no time. Some of us have a word from the Lord that we've been standing on, but without even realizing it, we put our time on his word. And church, that's not how he works. He puts his time on his word, and we put our hope in him. He puts his time on his word, and we put our hope on him, in him. That's it. And as I was praying for today, as I was just asking the Lord what he wanted to say, I felt like the Lord specifically spoke this to me, that there were people here today, someone here today, that you got off in your timing, you put your timing on a word from him that didn't come with timing. And I hear what the Lord is saying to us today, and it's, a, it's good news. He says, surrender the timing, and you'll step back into the joy and the peace that your heart longs for. <laughs> surrender the timing. Surrender the timing that you put on a word that didn't come with timing, and you will enter back into the peace of God that you long for in your heart. I believe he's saying, follow the peace. Follow the joy and just chill. Turn to somebody say, just chill. Come on, I know some of you are resisting it. Just do it. <laughs> See, here's the thing, church. When we put, when you put your time over his time, you'll miss it every time. I was just writing and that came out. It was amazing. I was like, where did that come from? When you put your time over his time, you'll miss it every time. Because you cannot manipulate God's time. You entrust yourself to his time. I want to say that again. You cannot manipulate God's time. We entrust ourselves to his time. God may take his time, but he always keeps his word. Always keeps his word. So this child was coming, but it wasn't coming in man's time, and it certainly wasn't coming in Zechariah and Elizabeth's time, or it would have been there years before. This child was coming in God's time, and God had a big plan for this child. God's time is the right time. And I believe that's a word for, for someone in the room today. The same angel that, that visited Zechariah is the same angel that came and visits Mary in Nazareth. And in the, in the 28th verse, it says he appears to her and he says this. You've heard this many times, but we're going to read it again. Verse 28, the angel Gabriel comes and says to Mary, Greetings. O oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary says to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Can we say come upon you? Come upon you. And the power, can we say power? Power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Can we say that line out together? For nothing will be impossible with God. I believe as, 
just read that, this scripture, this is a word for us today. It's not just a, a Christmas passage. It's a word from heaven. I believe that some of us have been living under labels today like Elizabeth was living under the label that she was one that was called barren. I believe that there are people in this room that have labeled themselves, been labeled by others, been called this, been called that. But I'm here to declare to you today that with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. If an elderly woman who waits her whole entire life to have a baby and in her advanced years can give birth to a child who will prepare the way for the Son of God. And if a virgin who can be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and can have an immaculate conception and give birth to the Son of God, I'm here to tell you that nothing's impossible with God. Nothing's impossible with God. If it's according to His Word, it's not impossible, it's possible. And I believe today that that the Lord is here to actually help us raise our faith, that faith would rise up in us again to believe the word of the Lord, that nothing is impossible if it's his word. I'm not talking about some cheap kind of name it, claim it, empty kinds of words. We're talking about faith rising up in the word of the Lord that's been spoken. So how does Mary respond to the word of the Lord? It says in verse 38, Mary said this. She said, Behold... I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So just thinking about this, like it's so easy to hear this story year after year after year. But of all the things that she could have said in response to all that she had heard. See, she didn't have... The context like we do, she didn't have the aerial view of, of all of this. I mean, it's hard enough for us to even grasp it, but we at least get the context of it. That girl didn't. They were looking for the Messiah, and it wasn't going to come that way. So this 15-year-old girl, she like, she like wakes up thinking she's having a normal day, and all of a sudden, this crazy thing happens. And I'm thinking, like, of all the responses, she could have been like, I don't want that. Like, I don't, I don't want that life. I don't want that life. I, I, I have got plans. I'm engaged, right? My plans do not include all that craziness that you just mentioned to me. But she, she doesn't. She responds with, with one of the most powerful answers, I think, in all of Scripture. This 15-ish-year-old girl, and they say she was 12 to 15. I'll just say she's 15. She responds with this most amazing response. I'm the servant of the Lord. I'm the servant of the Lord. What a posture that she carries. I'm a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. In other words, like whatever you say, my response is yes. Whatever you say, my response is yet. What the Lord says, I want. Like her son that would say much later, to say, not my will, but yours be done. The will of God be done. So when the angel comes, he, he calls her, oh, favored one, and he says, the Lord is with you. I mean, I cannot think of more powerful words to be spoken over a life than the Lord is with you. How many want the Lord to speak that over you? The Lord is with you. You know, I remember a, a time, probably five to ten years ago, I don't know, it was in that window eight years ago, and I remember being so afraid to preach. And Pastor Gary, he would just like leave for a month in Africa. <laughs> He'd just be like, have fun, Josh. I'd be like, what? I'm in charge? What are you talking about? You know, and I'd, I'd have to preach, and I'd be like so nervous, guys. I'd be like sick nervous, right? And, and the Lord would give me something, but I'd be so nervous. And I remember this one Saturday night I was hanging out at my, in my living room. Everybody had gone to bed, and I was just, just kind of praying. And I'm like, Jesus, I'm so nervous. I need you. I need you. I need you. And guys, I have to tell you, it hasn't happened very many times like this in my life. And I've shared this before, but I have to tell you, the manifest presence and power of God came in my living room that night. And he spoke to me in my heart, and he said, I am with you. He said, I am with you. And I have to tell you, in that moment, the fear broke off and the nerves broke off. And I went the next morning. I don't even remember what I preached. I hope it was awesome. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter because he was with me. 
And I'm here to tell you that when God touches you in a way and he says he's with you, it doesn't matter about anything else. It doesn't matter how difficult the things are before you, how many giants are before you. When he says I'm with you, that is all you need. That is all you need. That is all you need. And I just, I, I, that has stayed with me. And so it doesn't mean that there are times that I'm not afraid. Because I do get afraid. There doesn't mean there's not moments where I'm nervous and I don't know what to do. But I know that he is with me. Can't remember where I'm at. <clears throat> Here we go. That's what happens when the, the Lord is with you. <laughs> really? You don't know where you're going sometimes, right? Wait a minute. Where are we? Okay, that was a word for somebody. Just receive it. I'm kidding. <clears throat> I need to pause here. Hold on. Oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. Obviously, to be chosen to be the mother of the Son of God is, is like <laughs> the highest honor, Right? Here's the thing, favor doesn't always look like favor. Favor doesn't always look like what we might imagine it to look like. In fact, I get a little concerned in our Christian culture in, in what I see happening that our definition of favor gets easily distorted by some type of actual worldly mindset on what favor looks like, right? And we, we see this through Mary's life, we see it actually through all of Scripture that favor doesn't always equal easy. Amen? Favor doesn't always equal being accepted. And favor doesn't, doesn't actually often, favor with God actually often means trouble with men, with man and women. Like my wife when I say she's advanced in years. Why do I keep bringing it up? I'm making my life worse. The favor, though, here's the thing, the favor on Mary's life brought forth the hope of the entire world in Jesus, right? It was incredible, the favor of God on her life. But I got to tell you today, church, it cost her personally. It would, it would cause her life to be full of difficulty. And not just for a season, it would actually cost her difficulty for years to come. See, after the angel departed, she left quickly and she traveled, it says, it's like a hundred miles and spent three months with, with Elizabeth. And when Mary walked into the house, Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting and it says the baby and Elizabeth actually leapt in her womb and it says she was filled with the Holy Spirit. She cried out, again, blessed are you among women. Blessed are you, blessed is the fruit of your womb. So Mary's like, man, I'm blessed, I'm favor, I'm blessed. Verse 45. She says to Mary, she says, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. She's blessed. She's favored. Mary stayed with Elizabeth three months. And here's the thing. Then she returned to Nazareth. And when she did, she was visibly pregnant. And she was not married. And she was engaged. I think we hear this story so many times that the emotion of it leaves us. It's easy to be distant from the context of what that actually would mean. You can imagine, you can imagine though, that even though Mary had done nothing wrong, you can imagine the shame she might have felt. You can imagine the judgment. You can imagine all, all the looks that she might have endured. You can imagine the, the thoughts that she had. You can imagine the thoughts that she had about what the thoughts other people were thinking about her. Have you ever had those kind of thoughts? I wonder what they're thinking right now, right? What are they thinking? You can go crazy in that, right? That's a lot for a 15-year-old to deal with. I have a 15-year-old, and I know how hard it can be just to be a 15-year-old. The pressure and the mental gymnastics of immaculate conception. <laughs> Can you imagine this? Not, not to be able to explain it. And if you tried to explain it, nobody would believe it. It's a lot, right? And in that culture, engagement, was, if it was broken, it would have been like you would have had to, it would have required a legal divorce. People would either, th either think that she had had, um, you know, premarital sex with Joseph 
or that she had been fooling around on him. And if, if she'd been fooling around on him, she'd actually be, it'd be possible that she'd be stoned. I mean, that's a lot to weigh on somebody. And the rumors didn't just end after she had the baby. She knew she'd always be seen as a bearer of an illegitimate child. 30 years later, we know this in John chapter 8, where the religious leaders are questioning Jesus, and they say, hey, he, they insinuated Jesus was born of sexual immorality. Are you picking this up? Think about this. This was not like just, a, okay, they did that, whatever. This was like difficulty. This is what favor looked like. Mary, Mary was carrying a word that no one would believe. Imagine if you were Mary's friend and she came over for a sleepover and she told you that she was pregnant but had never had sex. You'd be like, whatever. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, I, we laugh about it, but I mean, imagine like the emotion and what she had to deal with and yet she still said, let it be unto me according to your word. This is favor. This is, you're blessed among women. See, does, favor doesn't always feel like what we imagine it to be. Favor isn't always like that front parking spot at Target opening up for you. When you're like, favor. And then the next day you go and then you have to park in the back and you're like, oh, I'm not favored. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Favor can look like, hey, you're going to have your baby in a stable. Sometimes favor doesn't look at all like we were expecting. The blessing of God, the call of God, does not always look like and feel like what we might have imagined it to look and to feel like. And here's what I want to say to you today. I think sometimes that without even intentionally knowing it or intentionally trying it, we can pick up mindsets that are not rooted in the scripture, not rooted in the gospel, not rooted in kingdom, that would make us think that following Jesus is smooth sailing. I want to tell you that if, if we're doing it right, Life is not always easy. Sometimes we think if we're doing it right, life should be easy. Life should be mostly problem-free. And church, I want to tell you as your pastor today, it's not true. It isn't true. Obedience doesn't always equal easy. Obedience often involves difficulty as we walk out the promises of God. And that's when you have to remember the word of the Lord. That's when you have to strengthen yourself in what he has said at the beginning. Oh, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. And I got to tell you again, if the Lord is with you, who can be against you? In the midst of whatever you're up against, how dark it is, how difficult it is, if you have the word of the Lord, you can stand against anything and everyone. The entire way in which Jesus came to, the, to save the world didn't make sense at the time. And honestly, to the natural mind, it, it still doesn't make sense. There was great expectation for the Messiah to come, but no one expected the way that he came would be the way that he would come. And I think in many ways for us, it's, it's the same. Many times when the Lord speaks a word to us or we read a word or the scripture stands out to us, God gives us a promise. It ends up not being how we expected it to be. Isn't that how it is whenever he's doing a new thing? When God calls us to something, I got to tell you, like I kind of thought like being the lead pastor would be like one way and I found in six months really quick, it's not what I thought. Somebody the other day, Gina's mom, she said, congratulations, and she said, and condolences. <laughs> I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I think I received that. I don't know. But here, you know, somebody, somebody the other day, they were like, hey, is this all going to your head? I'm like, I don't even understand that question. What does that even mean? Do you know what I mean? Like, we think something's going to look a certain way, and then we get there, and we find out that isn't the way it looks. With God, it's always better. It's just a different better. It's, it's always good with him. It's just a different good. It's gooder. 
more gooder. Yeah. When God calls us to something, we don't, we don't often understand it all. We might only get the first step. It isn't usually until much later that we can actually really see. But I believe today the greatest enemy of your word from the Lord is often your expectation of what it looks like. I've met so many people I've, that, that hear something from the Lord, a word from God, it is genuinely from God, but then they begin to expect it to look a certain way. And when it doesn't look the way that they expected, they go off the rails. We have to come back to what the Lord has said. We come back to the written word. We come back to the scripture. We come back to the prophetic words over our lives that we have gathered, that we, we have taken in our heart, that we know to be his word. And we anchor ourselves in his word, right? And we do not go beyond what he has said. I, I believe that, that, that there are those in the room that need to hear this today. We do not go beyond what he said. Because if we do, we become disoriented. We become disillusioned. And here's the thing, we can unintentionally add or imagine beyond what he has said. Now don't misunderstand me. I believe we're to dream with God. We're to imagine with God. There are so many amazing things that he wants to do and speak to us and places he's going to take us. But we cannot call it a word from the Lord if it's not a word from the Lord. Another, I could say it like this, if, if, he, if God's given you a few pieces of the puzzle of your life, don't pretend you've got all the pieces. Like if he gave you like a pie, but he only gave you a piece of the pie, don't, don't act like you've got the whole pie. I don't think that translates with you right now, but that's okay. See, Mary and Zachariah, they asked the same question. Basically the same question, but the difference is this. Zechariah asked with skeptical unbelief. Mary asked it in faith-filled wonder. Church, the posture of our questions determines so much. Determines so much. Zechariah and Mary didn't, they didn't feel faith first, they felt fear first. And then the word of the Lord came, right? Sometimes we think the presence of God and the holy visitation of God speaking to us should always make us actually feel really good. The truth is sometimes it actually scares the bejeebers out of us. I mean, when the Lord speaks something really radical to you, and there's a moment where it scares you, right? Because what God calls us to do and what he calls us to be will at times freak us out. And that's okay. But we don't stay in freak mode. We move into faith. We see, we, we walk by faith and we, not by freak. <laughs> we walk by faith and not by sight. And here's the thing. Every new season you walk into requires a fresh surrender. Over my life right now, a fresh surrender is being required. I cannot enter into what we're entering into. Josh Thompson cannot enter into this next phase without a fresh surrender. Last year's surrender isn't enough. A worship associate pastor isn't enough of a surrender. There's a different surrender right now that's being asked of my life, being required of my life to enter into access into all that he has for me. I believe it's the same for everyone in this room today. There are places in God that he's calling you to go to, but it's going to require a fresh surrender. Last year's surrender isn't enough. We're coming to the close of the year. We're coming to the close of a decade. The surrender you had in the teens isn't going to be enough for the 20s. It's going to require a fresh surrender. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. In closing, I believe that the Lord is reminding you today. He's going to remind you of things that he's spoken to you. I believe he wants to breathe on promises that he's given to you. And I believe he's going to bring some things back to life. Amen? things in you again to renew your faith so you can believe again. For some of you, it's, it's going to actually require a surrendering of your expectation of what you thought it was going to look like. For some of you, 
It's going to require you to surrender the timing of a word that didn't come with timing. And as you surrender the expectation and you surrender the timing, the peace and the joy are going to be restored to your heart. And even more than that, the joy in believing is going to come. The joy of believing is going to come. So you can't control what happens to you. You can't control what happens around you, but you can protect what is happening in you. Church, we have to be those that protect what's happening in us. We have to protect the peace. Amen? We have to protect the joy. We have to protect the faith and the trust in the word of the Lord. We have to protect our belief in, in our rootedness in the goodness of God over our lives. I believe the Lord is calling us out from comfortable places. We got one excited person over here. I want to say that again. I believe the Lord is calling us out from uncomfortable places. <laughs> Comfort is overrated. It's a deception. Seems really good, but it's not. The life is in the adventure of following. The life is in the surrender. The life is in the laying down. The life is in the yes. The life is in, in, in saying, my life is not my own. Let it be to me according to your word. I have a giant yes in me. How many this morning would say, I have a yes in me? Come on. Come on. If that's you, just lift your hand up. Just lift up your yes right now. Can we just begin to just say that one word out loud? Yes. You don't even know what it means right now. You don't know what it means, but I believe the Lord is going to fill that yes. He's going to begin to blow on the dreams that he's given you. He's going to begin to blow on the words that he's given you. He's going to blow on that yes in your heart, the things that he put in there. Come on, church, just lift your voices all over the room. We say yes. Whatever you want, Lord, we say yes. We say yes to you. We say yes to you. Maybe you have dreams. Maybe you have a plan. But are you willing to lay it down for a divine interruption? We say yes to the divine interruptions of our lives. Yes to you. 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 